part one of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by david wales life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain part one chapter fifty six we rumbled over the plains and valleys climbed the sierras to the clouds and looked down upon summer-clad california and i will remark here in passing that all scenery in california requires distance to give it its highest charm the mountains are imposing in their sublimity and their majesty of form and altitude from any point of view but one must have distance to soften their ruggedness and enrich their tintings a californian forest is best at a little distance for there is a sad poverty of variety in species the trees being chiefly of one monotonous family redwood pine spruce fir and so at a near view there is a wearisome sameness of attitude in their rigid arms stretched downward and outward in one continued and reiterated appeal to all men to shh don't say a word you might disturb somebody close at hand too there is a reliefless and relentless smell of pitch and turpentine there is a ceaseless melancholy in their sighing and complaining foliage one walks over a soundless carpet of beaten yellow bark and dead spines of the foliage till he feels like a wandering spirit bereft of a footfall he tires of the endless tufts of needles and yearns for substantial shapely leaves he looks for moss and grass to loll upon and finds none for where there is no bark there is naked clay and dirt enemies to pensive musing and clean apparel often a grassy plain in california is what it should be but often too it is best contemplated at a distance because although its grass blades are tall they stand up vindictively straight and self-sufficient and are unsociably wide apart with uncomely spots of barren sand between one of the queerest things i know of is to hear tourists from the states go into ecstasies over the loveliness of ever-blooming california and they always do go into that sort of ecstasies but perhaps they would modify them if they knew how old californians with the memory full upon them of the dust-covered and questionable summer greens of californian verdure stand astonished and filled with worshipping admiration in the presence of the lavish richness the brilliant green the infinite freshness the spendthrift variety of form and species and foliage that make an eastern landscape a vision of paradise itself the idea of a man falling into raptures over grave and sombre california when that man has seen new england's meadow expanses and her maples oaks and cathedral windowed elms decked in summer attire or the opaline splendors of autumn descending upon her forests comes very near being funny would be in fact but that it is so pathetic no land with an unvarying climate can be very beautiful the tropics are not for all the sentiment that is wasted on them they seem beautiful at first but sameness impairs the charm by and by change is the handmaiden nature requires to do her miracles with the land that has four well-defined seasons cannot lack beauty or pall with monotony each season brings a world of enjoyment and interest in the watching of its unfolding its gradual harmonious development its culminating graces and just as one begins to tire of it it passes away and a radical change comes with new witcheries and new glories in its train and i think that to one in sympathy with nature each season in its turn seems the loveliest san francisco a truly fascinating city to live in is stately and handsome at a fair distance 
but close at hand one notes that the architecture is mostly old-fashioned many streets are made up of decaying smoke-grimed wooden houses and the barren sand hills toward the outskirts obtrude themselves too prominently even the kindly climate is sometimes pleasanter when read about than personally experienced for a lovely cloudless sky wears out its welcome by and by and then when the longed-for rain does come it stays even the playful earthquake is better contemplated at a dis however there are varying opinions about that the climate of san francisco is mild and singularly equable the thermometer stands at about seventy degrees the year round it hardly changes at all you sleep under one or two light blankets summer and winter and never use a mosquito bar nobody ever wears summer clothing you wear black broadcloth if you have it in august and january just the same it is no colder and no warmer in the one month than the other you do not use overcoats and you do not use fans it is as pleasant a climate as could well be contrived take it all around and is doubtless the most unvarying in the whole world the wind blows there a good deal in the summer months but then you can go over to oakland if you choose three or four miles away it does not blow there it has only snowed twice in san francisco in nineteen years and then it only remained on the ground long enough to astonish the children and set them to wondering what the feathery stuff was during eight months of the year straight along the skies are bright and cloudless and never a drop of rain falls but when the other four months come along you will need to go and steal an umbrella because you will require it not just one day but one hundred and twenty days in hardly varying succession when you want to go visiting or attend church or the theatre you never look up at the clouds to see whether it is likely to rain or not you look at the almanac if it is winter it will rain and if it is summer it won't rain and you cannot help it you never need a lightning rod because it never thunders and it never lightens and after you have listened for six or eight weeks every night to the dismal monotony of those quiet rains you will wish in your heart the thunder would leap and crash and roar along those drowsy skies once and make everything alive you will wish the prisoned lightnings would cleave the dull firmament asunder and light it with a blinding glare for one little instant you would give anything to hear the old familiar thunder again and see the lightning strike somebody and along in the summer when you have suffered about four months of lustrous pitiless sunshine you are ready to go down on your knees and plead for rain hail snow thunder and lightning anything to break the monotony you will take an earthquake if you cannot do any better and the chances are that you'll get it too san francisco is built on sand hills but they are prolific sand hills they yield a generous vegetation all the rare flowers which people in the states rear with such patient care in parlor flower pots and greenhouses flourish luxuriantly in the open air there all the year round calla lilies all sorts of geraniums passion flowers moss roses i do not know the names of a tenth part of them i only know that while new yorkers are burdened with banks and drifts of snow californians are burdened with banks and drifts of flowers if they only keep their hands off and let them grow and i have heard that they have also that rarest and most curious of all flowers the beautiful espiritu santo as the spaniards call it or flower of the holy spirit though i thought it grew only in central america down on the isthmus in its cup is the daintiest little facsimile of a dove as pure as snow the spaniards have a superstitious reverence for it the blossom has been conveyed to the states submerged in ether and the bulb has been taken thither also but every attempt to make it bloom after it arrived has failed i have elsewhere spoken of the endless winter of mono california 
and but this moment of the eternal spring of san francisco now if we travel a hundred miles in a straight line we come to the eternal summer of sacramento one never sees summer clothing or mosquitoes in san francisco but they can be found in sacramento not always and unvaryingly but about one hundred and forty three months out of twelve years perhaps flowers bloom there always the reader can easily believe people suffer and sweat and swear morning noon and night and wear out their staunchest energies fanning themselves it gets hot there but if you go down to fort yuma you will find it hotter fort yuma is probably the hottest place on earth the thermometer stays at one hundred and twenty in the shade there all the time except when it varies and goes higher it is a u s military post and its occupants get so used to the terrific heat that they suffer without it there is a tradition attributed to john phoenix it has been purloined by fifty different scribblers who were too poor to invent a fancy but not ashamed to steal one m t that a very very wicked soldier died there once and of course went straight to the hottest corner of perdition and the next day he telegraphed back for his blankets there is no doubt about the truth of this statement there can be no doubt about it i have seen the place where that soldier used to board in sacramento it is fiery summer always and you can gather roses and eat strawberries and ice cream and wear white linen clothes and pant and perspire at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and then take the cars and at noon put on your furs and your skates and go skimming over frozen donner lake seven thousand feet above the valley among snow banks fifteen feet deep and in the shadow of grand mountain peaks that lift their frosty crags ten thousand feet above the level of the sea there is a transition for you where will you find another like it in the western hemisphere and some of us have swept around snow-walled curves of the pacific railroad in that vicinity six thousand feet above the sea and looked down as the birds do upon the deathless summer of the sacramento valley with its fruitful fields its feathery foliage its silver streams all slumbering in the mellow haze of its enchanted atmosphere and all infinitely softened and spiritualized by distance a dreamy exquisite glimpse of fairyland made all the more charming and striking that it was caught through a forbidden gateway of ice and snow and savage crags and precipices end of part one part two of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain part two chapter fifty seven it was in this sacramento valley just referred to that a deal of the most lucrative of the early gold mining was done and you may still see in places its grassy slopes and levels torn and guttered and disfigured by the avaricious spoilers of fifteen and twenty years ago you may see such disfigurements far and wide over california and in some such places where only meadows and forests are visible not a living creature not a house no stick or stone or remnant of a ruin and not a sound not even a whisper to disturb the sabbath stillness you will find it hard to believe that there stood at one time a fiercely flourishing little city of two thousand or three thousand souls with its newspaper fire company brass band volunteer militia bank hotels busy fourth of july processions and speeches gambling hells crammed with tobacco smoke profanity and rough-bearded men of all nations and colors with tables heaped with gold dust sufficient for the revenues of a german principality streets crowded and rife with business town lots worth four hundred dollars a front foot labor laughter music dancing swearing fighting shooting stabbing a bloody inquest and a man for breakfast every morning and everything that delights and adorns existence all the appointments and appurtenances of a thriving and prosperous and promising young city 
and now nothing is left of it but a lifeless homeless solitude the men are gone the houses have vanished even the name of the place is forgotten in no other land in modern times have towns so absolutely died and disappeared as in the old mining regions of california it was a driving vigorous restless population in those days it was a curious population it was the only population of the kind that the world has ever seen gathered together and it is not likely that the world will ever see its like again for observe it was an assemblage of two hundred thousand young men not simpering dainty kid-gloved weaklings but stalwart muscular dauntless young braves brimful of push and energy and royally endowed with every attribute that goes to make up a peerless and magnificent manhood the very pick and choice of the world's glorious ones no women no children no gray and stooping veterans none but erect bright-eyed quick-moving strong-handed young giants the strangest population the finest population the most gallant host that ever trooped down the startled solitudes of an unpeopled land and where are they now scattered to the ends of the earth or prematurely aged and decrepit or shot or stabbed in street affrays or dead of disappointed hopes and broken hearts all gone or nearly all victims devoted upon the altar of the golden calf the noblest holocaust that ever wafted its sacrificial incense heavenward it is pitiful to think upon it was a splendid population for all the slow sleepy sluggish-brained sloths stayed at home you never find that sort of people among pioneers you cannot build pioneers out of that sort of material it was that population that gave to california a name for getting up astounding enterprises and rushing them through with a magnificent dash and daring and a recklessness of cost or consequence which she bears unto this day and when she projects a new surprise the grave world smiles as usual and says well that is california all over but they were rough in those times they fairly reveled in gold whiskey fights and fandangos and were unspeakably happy the honest miner raked from a hundred to a thousand dollars out of his claim a day and what with the gambling dens and the other entertainments he hadn't a cent the next morning if he had any sort of luck they cooked their own bacon and beans sewed on their own buttons washed their own shirts blue woolen ones and if a man wanted a fight on his hands without any annoying delay all he had to do was to appear in public in a white shirt or a stovepipe hat and he would be accommodated for those people hated aristocrats they had a particular and malignant animosity toward what they called a biled shirt it was a wild free disorderly grotesque society men only swarming hosts of stalwart men nothing juvenile nothing feminine visible anywhere in those days miners would flock in crowds to catch a glimpse of that rare and blessed spectacle a woman old inhabitants tell how in a certain camp the news went abroad early in the morning that a woman was come they had seen a calico dress hanging out of a wagon down at the camping ground sign of immigrants from over the great plains everybody went down there and a shout went up when an actual bona fide dress was discovered fluttering in the wind the male immigrant was visible the miner said fetch her out he said it is my wife gentlemen she is sick we have been robbed of money provisions everything by the indians we want to rest fetch her out we've got to see her but gentlemen the poor thing she fetch her out he fetched her out and they swung their hats and sent up three rousing cheers and a tiger and they crowded around and gazed at her and touched her dress and listened to her voice with the look of men who listened to a memory rather than a present reality 
and then they collected twenty five hundred dollars in gold and gave it to the man and swung their hats again and gave three more cheers and went home satisfied once i dined in san francisco with the family of a pioneer and talked with his daughter a young lady whose first experience in san francisco was an adventure though she herself did not remember it as she was only two or three years old at the time her father said that after landing from the ship they were walking up the street a servant leading the party with the little girl in her arms and presently a huge miner bearded belted spurred and bristling with deadly weapons just down from a long campaign in the mountains evidently barred the way stopped the servant and stood gazing with a face all alive with gratification and astonishment and then he said reverently well if it ain't a child and then he snatched a little leather sack out of his pocket and said to the servant there's a hundred and fifty dollars in dust there and i'll give it to you to let me kiss the child that anecdote is true but see how things change sitting at that dinner table listening to that anecdote if i had offered double the money for the privilege of kissing the same child i would have been refused seventeen added years have far more than doubled the price and while upon this subject i will remark that once in star city in the humboldt mountains i took my place in a sort of long post office single file of miners to patiently await my chance to peep through a crack in the cabin and see a sight of the splendid new sensation a genuine live woman and at the end of half an hour my turn came and i put my eye to the crack and there she was with one arm akimbo and tossing flapjacks in a frying pan with the other and she was one hundred and sixty-five being in calmer mood now i voluntarily knock off a hundred from that m t years old and hadn't a tooth in her head end of part two part three of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain part three chapter fifty eight for a few months i enjoyed what to me was an entirely new phase of existence a butterfly idleness nothing to do nobody to be responsible to and untroubled with financial uneasiness i fell in love with the most cordial and sociable city in the union after the sagebrush and alkali deserts of washoe san francisco was paradise to me i lived at the best hotel exhibited my clothes in the most conspicuous places infested the opera and learned to seem enraptured with music which oftener afflicted my ignorant ear than enchanted it if i had had the vulgar honesty to confess it however i suppose i was not greatly worse than the most of my countrymen in that i had longed to be a butterfly and i was one at last i attended private parties in sumptuous evening dress simpered and aired my graces like a born beau and poked and shottished with a step peculiar to myself and the kangaroo in a word i kept the due state of a man worth a hundred thousand dollars prospectively and likely to reach absolute affluence when that silver mine sale should be ultimately achieved in the east i spent money with a free hand and meantime i watched the stock sales with an interested eye and looked to see what might happen in nevada something very important happened the property holders of nevada voted against the state constitution but the folks who had nothing to lose were in the majority and carried the measure over their heads but after all it did not immediately look like a disaster though unquestionably it was one i hesitated calculated the chances and then concluded not to sell stocks were on rising speculation went mad bankers merchants lawyers doctors mechanics laborers even the very washerwomen and servant girls 
were putting up their earnings on silver stocks and every sun that rose in the morning went down on paupers enriched and rich men beggared what a gambling carnival it was gould and curry soared to six thousand three hundred dollars a foot and then all of a sudden out went the bottom and everything and everybody went to ruin and destruction the wreck was complete the bubble scarcely left a microscopic moisture behind it i was an early beggar and a thorough one my hoarded stocks were not worth the paper they were printed on i threw them all away i the cheerful idiot that had been squandering money like water and thought myself beyond the reach of misfortune had not now as much as fifty dollars when i gathered together my various debts and paid them i removed from the hotel to a very private boarding-house i took a reporter's berth and went to work i was not entirely broken in spirit for i was building confidently on the sale of the silver mine in the east but i could not hear from dan my letters miscarried or were not answered one day i did not feel vigorous and remained away from the office the next day i went down toward noon as usual and found a note on my desk which had been there twenty-four hours it was signed marshall the virginia reporter and contained a request that i should call at the hotel and see him and a friend or two that night as they would sail for the east in the morning a postscript added that their errand was a big mining speculation i was hardly ever so sick in my life i abused myself for leaving virginia and entrusting to another man a matter i ought to have attended to myself i abused myself for remaining away from the office on the one day of all the year that i should have been there and thus berating myself i trotted a mile to the steamer wharf and arrived just in time to be too late the ship was in the stream and under way i comforted myself with the thought that maybe the speculation would amount to nothing poor comfort at best and then went back to my slavery resolved to put up with my thirty-five dollars a week and forget all about it a month afterward i enjoyed my first earthquake it was one which was long called the great earthquake and is doubtless so distinguished till this day it was just after noon on a bright october day i was coming down third street the only objects in motion anywhere in sight in that thickly built and populous quarter were a man in a buggy behind me and a street car wending slowly up the cross street otherwise all was solitude and a sabbath stillness as i turned the corner around a frame house there was a great rattle and jar and it occurred to me that here was an item no doubt a fight in that house before i could turn and seek the door there came a really terrific shock the ground seemed to roll under me in waves interrupted by a violent jogging up and down and there was a heavy grinding noise as of brick houses rubbing together i fell up against the frame house and hurt my elbow i knew what it was now and from mere repertorial instinct nothing else took out my watch and noted the time of day at that moment a third and still severer shock came and as i reeled about on the pavement trying to keep my footing i saw a sight the entire front of a tall four-story brick building in third street sprung outward like a door and fell sprawling across the street raising a dust like a great volume of smoke and here came the buggy overboard went the man and in less time than i can tell it the vehicle was distributed in small fragments along three hundred yards of street one could have fancied that somebody had fired a charge of chair rounds and rags down the thoroughfare the street car had stopped the horses were rearing and plunging the passengers were pouring out at both ends and one fat man had crashed halfway through a glass window on one side of the car got wedged fast and was squirming and screaming like an impaled madman every door of every house as far as the eye could reach 
was vomiting a stream of human beings and almost before one could execute a wink and begin another there was a massed multitude of people stretching in endless procession down every street my position commanded never was solemn solitude turned into teeming life quicker of the wonders wrought by the great earthquake these were all that came under my eye but the tricks it did elsewhere and far and wide over the town made toothsome gossip for nine days the destruction of property was trifling the injury to it was widespread and somewhat serious the curiosities of the earthquake were simply endless gentlemen and ladies who were sick or were taking a siesta or had dissipated till a late hour and were making up lost sleep thronged into the public streets in all sorts of queer apparel and some without any at all one woman who had been washing a naked child ran down the street holding it by the ankles as if it were a dressed turkey prominent citizens who were supposed to keep the sabbath strictly rushed out of saloons in their shirt sleeves with billiard cues in their hands dozens of men with necks swathed in napkins rushed from barber shops lathered to the eyes or with one cheek clean shaved and the other still bearing a hairy stubble horses broke from stables and a frightened dog rushed up a short attic ladder and out on to a roof and when his scare was over had not the nerve to go down again the same way he had gone up a prominent editor flew downstairs in the principal hotel with nothing on but one brief undergarment met a chambermaid and exclaimed oh what shall i do where shall i go she responded with naive serenity if you have no choice you might try a clothing store a certain foreign consul's lady was the acknowledged leader of fashion and every time she appeared in anything new or extraordinary the ladies in the vicinity made a raid on their husbands purses and arrayed themselves similarly one man who had suffered considerably and growled accordingly was standing at the window when the shocks came and the next instant the consul's wife just out of the bath fled by with no other apology for clothing than a bath towel the sufferer rose superior to the terrors of the earthquake and said to his wife now that is something like get out your towel my dear the plastering that fell from ceilings in san francisco that day would have covered several acres of ground for some days afterward groups of eyeing and pointing men stood about many a building looking at long zigzag cracks that extended from the eaves to the ground four feet of the tops of three chimneys on one house were broken square off and turned round in such a way as to completely stop the draught a crack a hundred feet long gaped open six inches wide in the middle of one street and then shut together again with such force as to ridge up the meeting earth like a slender grave a lady sitting in her rocking and quaking parlor saw the wall part at the ceiling open and shut twice like a mouth and then drop the end of a brick on the floor like a tooth she was a woman easily disgusted with foolishness and she arose and went out of there one lady who was coming downstairs was astonished to see a bronze hercules lean forward on its pedestal as if to strike her with its club they both reached the bottom of the flight at the same time the woman insensible from the fright her child, born some little time afterward, was club-footed. However, on second thought, if the reader sees any coincidence in this, he must do it at his own risk. The first shock brought down two or three huge organ pipes in one of the churches. The minister, with uplifted hands, was just closing the services. He glanced up, hesitated, and said, "'However, we will omit the benediction.' and the next instant there was a vacancy in the atmosphere where he had stood after the first shock an oakland minister said keep your seats there is no better place to die than this and added after the third but outside is good enough he then skipped out at the back door 
such another destruction of mantle ornaments and toilet bottles as the earthquake created san francisco never saw before there was hardly a girl or a matron in the city but suffered losses of this kind suspended pictures were thrown down but oftener still by a curious freak of the earthquake's humor they were whirled completely round with their faces to the wall there was great difference of opinion at first as to the course or direction the earthquake traveled but water that splashed out of various tanks and buckets settled that thousands of people were made so seasick by the rolling and pitching of floors and streets that they were weak and bedridden for hours and some few for even days afterward hardly an individual escaped nausea entirely the queer earthquake episodes that formed the staple of san francisco gossip for the next week would fill a much larger book than this and so i will diverge from the subject by and by in the due course of things i picked up a copy of the enterprise one day and fell under this cruel blow nevada mines in new york g m marshall sheba hurs and amos h rose who left san francisco last july for new york city with ores from mines in pinewood district humboldt county and on the reese river range have disposed of a mine containing six thousand feet and called the pine mountains consolidated for the sum of three million dollars the stamps on the deed which is now on its way to humboldt county from new york for record amounted to three thousand dollars which is said to be the largest amount of stamps ever placed on one document a working capital of a million dollars has been paid into the treasury and machinery has already been purchased for a large quartz mill which will be put up as soon as possible the stock in this company is all full paid and entirely unaccessible the ores of the mines in this district somewhat resemble those of the sheba mine in humboldt sheba hurst the discovery of the mines with his friends corralled all the best leads and all the land and timber they desired before making public their whereabouts ores from there assayed in this city showed them to be exceedingly rich in silver and gold silver predominating there is an abundance of wood and water in the district we are glad to know that new york capital has been enlisted in the development of the mines of this region having seen the ores and assays we are satisfied that the mines of the district are very valuable anything but wildcat once more native imbecility had carried the day and i had lost a million it was the blind lead over again let us not dwell on this miserable matter if i were inventing these things i could be wonderfully humorous over them but they are too true to be talked of with hearty levity even at this distant day true and yet not exactly as given in the above figures possibly i saw marshall months afterwards and although he had plenty of money he did not claim to have captured an entire million in fact i gathered that he had not then received fifty thousand dollars beyond that figure his fortune appeared to consist of uncertain vast expectations rather than prodigious certainties however when the above item appeared in print i put full faith in it and incontinently wilted and went to seed under it suffice it that i so lost heart and so yielded myself up to repinings and sighings and foolish regrets that i neglected my duties and became about worthless as a reporter for a brisk newspaper and at last one of the proprietors took me aside with a charity i still remember with considerable respect and gave me an opportunity to resign my berth and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal end of part three part four of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain part four chapter fifty nine for a time i wrote literary screeds for the golden era 
c h webb had established a very excellent literary weekly called the californian but high merit was no guarantee of success it languished and he sold out to three printers and bret hart became editor at twenty dollars a week and i was employed to contribute an article a week at twelve dollars but the journal still languished and the printers sold out to captain ogden a rich man and a pleasant gentleman who chose to amuse himself with such an expensive luxury without much caring about the cost of it when he grew tired of the novelty he resold to the printers the paper presently died a peaceful death and i was out of work again i would not mention these things but for the fact that they so aptly illustrate the ups and downs that characterize life on the pacific coast a man could hardly stumble into such a variety of queer vicissitudes in any other country for two months my sole occupation was avoiding acquaintances for during that time i did not earn a penny or buy an article of any kind or pay my board i became a very adept at slinking i slunk from back street to back street i slunk away from approaching faces that looked familiar i slunk to my meals ate them humbly and with a mute apology for every mouthful i robbed my generous landlady of and at midnight after wanderings that were but slinkings away from cheerfulness and light i slunk to my bed i felt meaner and lowlier and more despicable than the worms during all this time i had but one piece of money a silver ten-cent piece and i held to it and would not spend it on any account lest the consciousness coming strong upon me that i was entirely penniless might suggest suicide i had pawned everything but the clothes i had on so i clung to my dime desperately till it was smooth with handling however i am forgetting i did have one other occupation besides that of slinking it was the entertaining of a collector and being entertained by him who had in his hands the virginia banker's bill for forty six dollars which i had loaned my schoolmate the prodigal this man used to call regularly once a week and dun me and sometimes oftener he did it from sheer force of habit for he knew he could get nothing he would get out his bill calculate the interest for me at five per cent a month and show me clearly that there was no attempt at fraud in it and no mistakes and then plead and argue and dun with all his might for any sum any little trifle even a dollar even half a dollar on the count then his duty was accomplished and his conscience free he immediately dropped the subject there always got out a couple of cigars and divided put his feet in the window and then we would have a long luxurious talk about everything and everybody and he would furnish me a world of curious dunning adventures out of the ample store in his memory by and by he would clap his hat on his head shake hands and say briskly well uh, business is business can't stay with you always and was off in a second the idea of pining for a dun and yet i used to long for him to come and would get as uneasy as any mother if the day went by without his visit when i was expecting him but he never collected that bill at last nor any part of it i lived to pay it to the banker myself misery loves company now and then at night in out-of-the-way dimly lighted places i found myself happening on another child of misfortune he looked so seedy and forlorn so homeless and friendless and forsaken that i yearned toward him as a brother i wanted to claim kinship with him and go about and enjoy our wretchedness together the drawing toward each other must have been mutual at any rate we got to falling together oftener though still seemingly by accident and although we did not speak or evince any recognition i think the dull anxiety passed out of both of us when we saw each other and then for several hours we would idle along contentedly wide apart and glancing furtively in at home lights and fireside gatherings out of the night shadows and very much enjoying our dumb companionship 
finally we spoke and were inseparable after that for our woes were identical almost he had been a reporter too and lost his birth and this was his experience as nearly as i can recollect it after losing his birth he had gone down 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 with never a halt from a boarding-house on russian hill to a boarding-house in kearney street from thence to dupont from thence to a low sailor den and from thence to lodgings in goods boxes and empty hogsheads near the wharves then for a while he had gained a meagre living by sewing up bursted sacks of grain on the piers when that failed he had found food here and there as chance threw it in his way he had ceased to show his face in daylight now for a reporter knows everybody rich and poor high and low and cannot well avoid familiar faces in the broad light of day this mendicant blucher i call him that for convenience was a splendid creature he was full of hope pluck and philosophy he was well read and a man of cultivated taste he had a bright wit and was a master of satire his kindliness and his generous spirit made him royal in my eyes and changed his curbstone seat to a throne and his damaged hat to a crown he had an adventure once which sticks fast in my memory as the most pleasantly grotesque that ever touched my sympathies he had been without a penny for two months he had shirked about obscure streets among friendly dim lights till the thing had become second nature to him but at last he was driven abroad in daylight the cause was sufficient he had not tasted food for forty-eight hours and he could not endure the misery of his hunger in idle hiding he came along a back street glowering at the loaves and bake shop windows and feeling that he could trade his life away for a morsel to eat the sight of the bread doubled his hunger but it was good to look at anyhow and imagine what one might do if one only had it presently in the middle of the street he saw a shining spot looked again did not and could not believe his eyes turning away to try them then looked again it was a verity no vain hunger-inspired delusions it was a silver dime he snatched it gloated over it doubted it bit it found it genuine choked his heart down and smothered an alleluia then he looked around saw that nobody was looking at him threw the dime down where it was before walked away a few steps and approached again pretending he did not know it was there so that he could re-enjoy the luxury of finding it he walked around it viewing it from different points then sauntered about with his hands in his pockets looking up at the signs and now and then glancing at it and feeling the old thrill again finally he took it up and went away fondling it in his pocket he idled through unfrequented streets stopping in doorways and corners to take it out and look at it by and by he went home to his lodgings an empty queensware hogshead and employed himself till night trying to make up his mind what to buy with it but it was hard to do to get the most for it was the idea he knew that at the miner's restaurant he could get a plate of beans and a piece of bread for ten cents or a fish ball and some few trifles but they gave no bread with one fish ball there at french pete's he could get a veal cutlet plain and some radishes and bread for ten cents or a cup of coffee a pint at least and a slice of bread but the slice was not thick enough by the eighth of an inch and sometimes they were still more criminal than that in the cutting of it at seven o'clock his hunger was wolfish and still his mind was not made up he turned out and went up merchant street still ciphering and chewing a bit of stick as is the way of starving men he passed before the lights of martin's restaurant the most aristocratic in the city and stopped it was a place where he had often dined in better days and martin knew him well standing aside just out of the range of the light he worshipped the quails and steaks in the show window 
and imagined that may be the fairy times were not gone yet and some prince in disguise would come along presently and tell him to go in there and take whatever he wanted he chewed his stick with a hungry interest as he warmed to his subject just at this juncture he was conscious of someone at his side sure enough and then a finger touched his arm he looked up over his shoulder and saw an apparition a very allegory of hunger it was a man six feet high gaunt unshaven hung with rags with a haggard face and sunken cheeks and eyes that pleaded piteously this phantom said come with me please he locked his arm in blucher's and walked up the street to where the passengers were few and the light not strong and then facing about put out his hands in a beseeching way and said friend stranger look at me life is easy to you you go about placid and content as i did once in my day you have been in there and eaten your sumptuous supper and picked your teeth and hummed your tune and thought your pleasant thoughts and said to yourself it is a good world but you've never suffered you don't know what trouble is you don't know what misery is nor hunger look at me stranger have pity on a poor friendless homeless dog as god is my judge i have not tasted food for eight and forty hours look in my eyes and see if i lie give me the least trifle in the world to keep me from starving anything twenty-five cents do it stranger do it please it will be nothing to you but life to me do it and i will go down on my knees and lick the dust before you i will kiss your footprints i will worship the very ground you walk on only twenty-five cents i am famishing perishing starving by inches for god's sake don't desert me blucher was bewildered and touched too stirred to the depths he reflected thought again then an idea struck him and he said come with me he took the outcast's arm and walked him down to martin's restaurant seated him at a marble table placed the bill of fare before him and said order what you want friend charge it to me mr martin all right mr blucher said martin then blucher stepped back and leaned against the counter and watched the man stow away cargo after cargo of buckwheat cakes at seventy-five cents a plate cup after cup of coffee and porterhouse steaks worth two dollars apiece and when six dollars and a half's worth of destruction had been accomplished and the stranger's hunger appeased blucher went down to french pete's bought a veal cutlet plain a slice of bread and three radishes with his dime and set two and feasted like a king take the episode all around it was as odd as any that can be culled from the myriad curiosities of california life perhaps end of part four part five of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain part five chapter sixty by and by an old friend of mine a miner came down from one of the decayed mining camps of tuolumne california and i went back with him we lived in a small cabin on a verdant hillside and there were not five other cabins in view over the wide expanse of hill and forest yet a flourishing city of two or three thousand population had occupied this grassy dead solitude during the flush times of twelve or fifteen years before and where our cabin stood had once been the heart of the teeming hive the centre of the city when the mines gave out the town fell into decay and in a few years wholly disappeared streets dwellings shops everything and left no sign the grassy slopes were as green and smooth and desolate of life as if they had never been disturbed the mere handful of miners still remaining had seen the town springing up spread grow and flourish in its pride and they had seen it sicken and die and pass away like a dream 
with it their hopes had died and their zest of life they had long ago resigned themselves to their exile and ceased to correspond with their distant friends or turn longing eyes toward their early homes they had accepted banishment forgotten the world and been forgotten of the world they were far from telegraphs and railroads and they stood as it were in a living grave dead to the events that stirred the globe's great populations dead to the common interests of men isolated and outcast from brotherhood with their kind it was the most singular and almost the most touching and melancholy exile that fancy can imagine one of my associates in this locality for two or three months was a man who had had a university education but now for eighteen years he had decayed there by inches a bearded rough-clad clay-stained miner and at times among his sighings and soliloquizings he unconsciously interjected vaguely remembered latin and greek sentences dead and musty tongues meet vehicles for the thoughts of one whose dreams were all of the past whose life was a failure a tired man burdened with the present and indifferent to the future a man without ties hopes interests waiting for rest and the end in that one little corner of california is found a species of mining which is seldom or never mentioned in print it is called pocket mining and i am not aware that any of it is done outside of that little corner the gold is not evenly distributed through the surface dirt as in ordinary placer mines but is collected in little spots and they are very wide apart and exceedingly hard to find but when you do find one you reap a rich and sudden harvest there are not now more than twenty pocket miners in that entire little region i think i know every one of them personally i have known one of them to hunt patiently about the hillsides every day for eight months without finding gold enough to make a snuff-box his grocery bill running up relentlessly all the time and then find a pocket and take out of it two thousand dollars in two dips of his shovel i have known him to take out three thousand dollars in two hours and go and pay up every cent of his indebtedness then enter on a dazzling spree that finished the last of his treasure before the night was done and the next day he bought his groceries on credit as usual and shouldered his pan and shovel and went off to the hills hunting pockets again happy and content this is the most fascinating of all the different kinds of mining and furnishes a very handsome percentage of victims to the lunatic asylum pocket hunting is an ingenious process you take a spadeful of earth from the hillside and put it in a large tin pan and dissolve and wash it gradually away till nothing is left but a teaspoonful of fine sediment whatever gold was in that earth has remained because being the heaviest it has sought the bottom among the sediment you will find half a dozen yellow particles no larger than pinheads you are delighted you move off to one side and wash another pan if you find gold again you move to one side further and wash a third pan if you find no gold this time you are delighted again because you know you are on the right scent you lay an imaginary plan shaped like a fan with its handle up the hill for just where the end of the handle is you argue that the rich deposit lies hidden whose vagrant grains of gold have escaped and been washed down the hill spreading farther and farther apart as they wandered and so you proceed up the hill washing the earth and narrowing your lines every time the absence of gold in the pan shows you that you are outside the spread of the fan and at last twenty yards up the hill your lines have converged to a point a single foot from that point you cannot find any gold your breath comes short and quick you are feverish with the excitement the dinner bell may ring its clapper off you pay no attention friends may die weddings transpire houses burn down 
they are nothing to you you sweat and dig and delve with a frantic interest and all at once you strike it up comes a spadeful of earth and quartz that is all lovely with soiled lumps and leaves and sprays of gold sometimes that one spadeful is all five hundred dollars sometimes the nest contains ten thousand dollars and it takes you three or four days to get it all out the pocket miners tell of one nest that yielded sixty thousand dollars and two men exhausted it in two weeks and then sold the ground for ten thousand dollars to a party who never got three hundred dollars out of it afterward the hogs are good pocket hunters all the summer they root around the bushes and turn up a thousand little piles of dirt and then the miners long for the rains for the rains beat upon these little piles and wash them down and expose the gold possibly right over a pocket two pockets were found in this way by the same man in one day one had five thousand dollars in it and the other eight thousand dollars that man could appreciate it for he hadn't had a cent for over a year in tuolumne lived two miners who used to go to the neighboring village in the afternoon and return every night with household supplies part of the distance they traversed a trail and nearly always sat down to rest on a great boulder that lay beside the path in the course of thirteen years they had worn that boulder tolerably smooth sitting on it by and by two vagrant mexicans came along and occupied the seat they began to amuse themselves by chipping off flakes from the boulder with a sledgehammer they examined one of these flakes and found it rich with gold that boulder paid them eight hundred dollars afterward but the aggravating circumstance was that these greasers knew that there must be more gold where that boulder came from and so they went panning up the hill and found what was probably the richest pocket that region has yet produced it took three months to exhaust it and it yielded a hundred and twenty thousand dollars the two american miners who used to sit on the boulder are poor yet and they take turn about in getting up early in the morning to curse those mexicans and when it comes down to pure ornamental cursing the native american is gifted above the sons of men i have dwelt at some length upon this matter of pocket mining because it is a subject that is seldom referred to in print and therefore i judged that it would have for the reader that interest which naturally attaches to novelty End of part five part six of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6, Chapter 61 One of my comrades there, another of these victims of eighteen years of unrequited toil and blighted hopes, was one of the gentlest spirits that ever bore its patient cross in a weary exile. Grave and simple Dick Baker, pocket miner of Dead House Gulch. He was forty-six, gray as a rat, earnest thoughtful slenderly educated slouchily dressed and clay soiled but his heart was finer metal than any gold his shovel ever brought to light than any indeed that ever was mined or minted whenever he was out of luck and a little downhearted he would fall to mourning over the loss of a wonderful cat he used to own for where women and children are not men of kindly impulses take up with pets for they must love something and he always spoke of the strange sagacity of that cat with the air of a man who believed in his secret heart that there was something human about it maybe even supernatural i heard him talking about this animal once he said gentlemen i used to have a cat here by the name of tom quartz which you'd a took an interest in i reckon most anybody would i had him here eight year and he was the remarkablest cat i ever see he was a large gray one of the tom species and he had more hard natural sense than any man in his camp and a power of dignity he wouldn't let the governor of californy be familiar with him he never catched a rat in his life feared to be above it 
he never cared for nothing but mining he knowed more about mining that cat did than any man i ever ever see you couldn't tell him nothing about placer diggins and as for pocket mining why he was just born for it he would dig out after me and jim when we went over the hills prospectin and he would trot along behind us for as much as five mile if we went so fur and he had the best judgment about mining ground why you never see anything like it when we went to work he'd scatter a glance around and if he didn't think much of the indications he would give a look as much as to say well i'll have to get you to excuse me and without another word he'd heist his nose into the air and shove for home but if the ground suited him he would lay low and keep dark till the first pan was washed and then he would sidle up and take a look and if there was about six or seven grains of gold he was satisfied he didn't want no better prospect than that and then he would lay down on our coats and snore like a steamboat till we'd struck the pocket and then get up and superintend he was nearly lightning on superintendin well by and by up comes this year quartz excitement everybody was into it everybody was pickin and blastin instead of shovelin dirt on the hillside everybody was puttin down a shaft instead of scrapin the surface nothin would do jim but we must tackle the ledges too and so we did we commenced puttin down a shaft and tom quartz he begun to wonder what in the dickens it was all about he hadn't ever seen any mining like that before and he was all upset as you may say he couldn't come to a right understanding of it no way it was too many for him he was down on it too you bet you he was down on it powerful and always appeared to consider it the cussedest foolishness out but that cat you know was always again new-fangled arrangements somehow he never could abide em you know how it is with old habits but by and by tom quartz began to get sort of reconciled a bit though he never could altogether understand that eternal sinking of a shaft and never panning out anything at last he got to coming down in the shaft hisself to try to cipher it out and when he get the blues and feel kind of scruffy and aggravated and disgusted knowing as he did that the bills was running up all the time and we weren't making the cent he would curl up on a gunny sack in the corner and go to sleep well one day when the shaft was down about eight foot the rock got so hard that we had to put in a blast the first blastin we'd ever done since tom quartz was born and then we let the fuse and clum out and got off about fifty yards and forgot and left tom quartz sound asleep on the gunny sack in about a minute we seen a puff of smoke burst up out of the hole and then everything let go with an awful crash and about four million ton of rocks and dirt and smoke and splinters shot up about a mile and a half in the air and by george right in the dead centre of it was old tom quartz a goin end over end and a snortin and a sneezin and a clawin and a reachin for things like all possessed but it warn't no use you know it warn't no use and that was the last we see of him for about two minutes and a half and then all of a sudden it begun to rain rocks and rubbish and directly he come down kerwop about ten foot off from where we stood well i reckon he was perhaps the orneriest looking beast you ever see one ear was sot back on his neck and his tail was stove up and his eye whiskers was singed off and he was all blacked up with powder and smoke and all sloppy with mud and slush from one end to the other well sir it warn't no use to try to apologize we couldn't say a word he took a sort of a disgusted look at himself and then he looked at us and it was just exactly the same as if he had said gents maybe you think it's smart to take advantage of a cat that ain't got no experience of quartz mining but i think different and then he turned on his heel and marched off home without ever saying another word that was just his style and maybe you won't believe it but after that you never see a cat so prejudiced against quartz mining as what he was 
and by and by when he did get to going down in the shaft again you'd have been astonished at his sagacity the minute we'd detach off a blast and the fuse began to sizzle he'd give a look as much as to say well i'll have to get you to excuse me and it was surprising the way he'd shin out of that hole and go for a tree sagacity it ain't no name for it twas inspiration i said well mr baker his prejudice against quartz mining was remarkable considering how he came by it couldn't you ever cure him of it cure him no when tom quartz was sought once he was always sought and you might a blowed him up as much as three million times and you'd never broken him of his cussed prejudice again quartz mining the affection and the pride that lit up baker's face when he delivered this tribute to the firmness of his humble friend of other days will always be a vivid memory with me at the end of two months we had never struck a pocket we had panned up and down the hillsides till they looked ploughed like a field we could have put in a crop of grain then but there would have been no way to get it to market we got many good prospects but when the gold gave out in the pan and we dug down hoping and longing we found only emptiness the pocket that should have been there was as barren as our own at last we shouldered our pans and shovels and struck out over the hills to try new localities we prospected round angel's camp in calaveras county during three weeks but had no success then we wandered on foot among the mountains sleeping under the trees at night for the weather was mild but still we remained as scentless as the last rose of summer that is a poor joke but it is in pathetic harmony with the circumstances since we were so poor ourselves in accordance with the custom of the country our door had always stood open and our board welcome to tramping miners they drifted along nearly every day dumped their post shovels by the threshold and took potluck with us and now on our own tramp we never found cold hospitality our wanderings were wide and in many directions and now i could give the reader a vivid description of the big trees and the marvels of the yosemite but what has this reader done to me that i should persecute him i will deliver him into the hands of less conscientious tourists and take his blessing let me be charitable though i fail in all virtues else note some of the phrases in the above are mining technicalities purely and may be a little obscure to the general reader in placer diggings the gold is scattered all through the surface dirt in pocket diggings it is concentrated in one little spot in quartz the gold is in a solid continuous vein of rock enclosed between distinct walls of some other kind of stone and this is the most laborious and expensive of all the different kinds of mining prospecting is hunting for a placer indications are signs of its presence panning out refers to the washing process by which the grains of gold are separated from the dirt a prospect is what one finds in the first panful of dirt and its value determines whether it is a good or a bad prospect and whether it is worth while to tarry there or seek further end of part six part seven of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain part seven chapter seventy eight return to california after a trip to hawaii after half a year's luxurious vagrancy in the islands i took shipping in a sailing vessel and regretfully returned to san francisco a voyage in every way delightful but without an incident unless lying two long weeks in a dead calm eighteen hundred miles from the nearest land may rank as an incident schools of whales grew so tame that day after day they played about the ship among the porpoises and the sharks without the least apparent fear of us and we pelted them with empty bottles for lack of better sport 
twenty-four hours afterward these bottles would be still lying on the glassy water under our noses showing that the ship had not moved out of her place in all that time the calm was absolutely breathless and the surface of the sea absolutely without a wrinkle for a whole day and part of a night we lay so close to another ship that had drifted to our vicinity that we carried on conversations with her passengers introduced each other by name and became pretty intimately acquainted with people we had never heard of before and never heard of since this was the only vessel we saw during the whole lonely voyage we had fifteen passengers and to show how hard pressed they were at last for occupation and amusement i will mention that the gentlemen gave a good part of their time every day during the calm to try to sit on an empty champagne bottle lying on its side and thread a needle without touching their heels to the deck or falling over and the ladies sat in the shade of the mainsail and watched the enterprise with absorbing interest we were at sea five sundays and yet but for the almanac we never would have known but that all the other days were sundays too i was home again in san francisco without means and without employment i tortured my brain for a saving scheme of some kind and at last a public lecture occurred to me i sat down and wrote one in a fever of hopeful anticipation i showed it to several friends but they all shook their heads they said nobody would come to hear me and i would make a humiliating failure of it they said that as i had never spoken in public i would break down in the delivery anyhow i was disconsolate now but at last an editor slapped me on the back and told me to go ahead he said take the largest house in town and charge a dollar a ticket the audacity of the proposition was charming it seemed fraught with practical worldly wisdom however the proprietor of the several theatres endorsed the advice and said i might have his handsome new opera house at half price fifty dollars in sheer desperation i took it on credit for sufficient reasons in three days i did a hundred and fifty dollars worth of printing and advertising and was the most distressed and frightened creature on the pacific coast i could not sleep who could under such circumstances for other people there was facetiousness in the last line of my posters but to me it was plaintive with a pang when i wrote it doors open at seven and a half the trouble will begin at eight that line has done good service since showmen have borrowed it frequently i have even seen it appended to a newspaper advertisement reminding school pupils in vacation what time next term would begin as those three days of suspense dragged by i grew more and more unhappy i had sold two hundred tickets among my personal friends but i feared they might not come my lecture which had seemed humorous to me at first grew steadily more and more dreary till not a vestige of fun seemed left and i grieved that i could not bring a coffin on the stage and turn the thing into a funeral i was so panic-stricken at last that i went to three old friends giants in stature cordial by nature and stormy voiced and said this thing is going to be a failure the jokes in it are so dim that nobody will ever see them i would like to have you sit in the parquet and help me through they said they would then i went to the wife of a popular citizen and said that if she was willing to do me a very great kindness i would be glad if she and her husband would sit prominently in the left-hand stage box where the whole house could see them i explained that i should need help and would turn toward her and smile as a signal when i had been delivered of an obscure joke and then i added don't wait to investigate but respond she promised down the street i met a man i never had seen before he had been drinking and was beaming with smiles and good nature he said my name's sawyer you don't know me but that don't matter i haven't got a cent but if you knew how bad i wanted to laugh you'd give me a ticket come now what do you say is your laugh hung on a hair trigger 
that is is it critical or can you get it off easy my drawling infirmity of speech so affected him that he laughed a specimen or two that struck me as being about the article i wanted and i gave him a ticket and appointed him to sit in the second circle in the centre and be responsible for that division of the house i gave him minute instructions about how to detect indistinct jokes and then went away and left him chuckling placidly over the novelty of the idea i ate nothing on the last of the three eventful days i only suffered i had advertised that on this third day the box office would be open for the sake of reserved seats i crept down to the theatre at four in the afternoon to see if any sales had been made the ticket seller was gone the box office was locked up i had to swallow suddenly or my heart would have got out no sales i said to myself i might have known it i thought of suicide pretended illness flight i thought of these things in earnest for i was very miserable and scared but of course i had to drive them away and prepare to meet my fate i could not wait for half-past seven i wanted to face the horror and end it the feeling of many a man doomed to hang no doubt i went down back streets at six o'clock and entered the theatre by the back door i stumbled my way in the dark among the ranks of canvas scenery and stood on the stage the house was gloomy and silent and its emptiness depressing i went into the dark among the scenes again and for an hour and a half gave myself up to the horrors wholly unconscious of everything else then i heard a murmur it rose higher and higher and ended in a crash mingled with cheers it made my hair rise it was so close to me and so loud there was a pause and then another presently came a third and before i well knew what i was about i was in the middle of the stage staring at a sea of faces bewildered by the fierce glare of the lights and quaking in every limb with a terror that seemed like to take my life away the house was full aisles and all the tumult in my heart and brain and legs continued a full minute before i could gain any command over myself then i recognized the charity and the friendliness in the faces before me and little by little my fright melted away and i began to talk within three or four minutes i was comfortable and even content my three chief allies with three auxiliaries were on hand in the parquet all sitting together all armed with bludgeons and all ready to make an onslaught upon the feeblest joke that might show its head and whenever a joke did fall their bludgeons came down and their faces seemed to split from ear to ear sawyer whose hearty countenance was seen looming redly in the centre of the second circle took it up and the house was carried handsomely inferior jokes never fared so royally before presently i delivered a bit of serious matter with impressive unction it was my pet and the audience listened with an absorbed hush that gratified me more than any applause and as i dropped the last word of the clause i happened to turn and catch mrs blank's intent and waiting eye my conversation with her flashed upon me and in spite of all i could do i smiled she took it for the signal and promptly delivered a mellow laugh that touched off the whole audience and the explosion that followed was the triumph of the evening i thought that that honest man sawyer would choke himself and as for the bludgeons they performed like pile drivers but my poor little morsel of pathos was ruined it was taken in good faith as an intentional joke and the prize won of the entertainment and i wisely let it go at that all the papers were kind in the morning my appetite returned i had an abundance of money all's well that ends well end of part seven end of life in california excerpted from roughing it by mark twain